Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Josh and Aaron with the Finley Mortgage Team. Today, we wanted to take a look at some of the uh, top nine ways that you could get into real estate investing in the different uh, ventures that are out there. We get a lot of people who are looking to grow and get into real estate investing and are curious as to you know how they can go about that and what pathways they're able to take. So we dialed in on nine um, you know, pretty predominant ones that we see and um, are pretty available to those who are brand new, but also maybe a little bit more advanced and are looking for different pathways to get into. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Canadian Real Estate Channel. Today, you've got Adam J.D. Martin here to introduce you to another Finlay Finance Fridays. And today, we're gonna to be talking about nine different ways that you could actually get started in real estate investing. This is a great piece of advice to come right from your power team, right from your favorite mortgage agents, so that you know how to get financing on the various strategies that you could look into investing in real estate. Let's jump right in. Let's start off with the, with the one that hits close to Matt that's hard is uh, wholesaling. So wholesaling is a great way to either create revenue or get a really great deal. So if anybody who doesn't know what wholesaling is, wholesaling essentially is you canvas an area, um, you are able to lock up a property, usually it's in distress or under value and then you are able to sign that deal to an investor. And whatever the purchase price is that you lock it up for versus what you're gonna sell it for, that's a wholesale fee and you can you can make quite a bit of money on that wholesale fee depending on the, uh, the deal that you're able to package yeah this this one's really gonna involve um, you know a lot of advertising and marketing you know we've seen strategies from cold calling to door knocking um, to flyers large flyer campaign um, you know creating those relationships with just realtors or other investors who are looking to offload big portfolios and like Josh said it can be quite profitable if you're able to find those deals that are super undervalued and you know there's more than enough room to take on your fee it's become a really popular thing in Ontario that we've seen a lot of um, you know a lot of the investors that we work with are picking up these deals off of these wholesaling network lists. So, you know, it can be a really great opportunity to get into the game, get experience with real estate, build the network, and be able to use that moving forward into other adventures. Yeah, great way to create a lot of wealth. If you guys are interested, Matt does have his own team, and so does Adam. You know, they are absolutely crushing it. So, if you have any questions about wholesaling, they're the guys to talk to. All right, guys, so moving away from wholesaling, we're going to move right into wholesaling. And wholesaling is almost the same, but a little bit different. So, wholesaling is essentially you find a wholesale deal, you close on it, and you relist it right away. And that, that lift that you would have got from the wholesale, you would get it from selling the property. Um, it's a little bit different than a quick lipstick flip because it's just an immediate sale of the property, but there's a lot of lift to be had and a lot of money to be made if you can find the right deal. Yeah, essentially this just takes advantage of the fact that you know, you know that the price that you're picking it up for already has profit built in. So you don't need to put in your renovations into it. There is no capital expenditure needed. It's just a quick list and sale and you're almost flipping it right away without actually putting any additional capital into it. So sometimes some of our investors will find a deal and they know that that profit's already still baked into the deal and they'll just pick it up, relist it and sell it off on the MLS without really having to put any additional work into it. So it can be a quick, quick little adventure and make a little bit of additional capital to help you out moving forwards. The third one that we want to talk about uh, is house hacking. It's a pretty hot topic as of late. Um, obviously, as the prices of houses have started to go up, uh, your mortgage payments are going up, and you know what better way to kind of live in a property and reducing than uh, reducing your monthly payments and having somebody else live in that property with you and helping to pay off the mortgage. So we have quite a few options on the house hacking. You can pick up you know a, a duplex, a triplex, and a fourplex, and there's insured options for all these as well too. So this doesn't necessarily entail you going out and putting twenty. 20, 25% down on a property, you, know, you can get an insured duplex for 5% down and a three and a four unit building for 10% down. So they have those insured options available. Another pretty hot way to be doing the house hacking right now is these duplex conversions um, or even adding a, a garden suite onto your property if you're zoned for it and you have enough room. Um, you know, If you have a huge basement, that duplex conversion gives you a really great option to add secondary income source. And if it's a legal unit, you, know, you can use that rental income moving forward as you start investing into other properties to help in your qualifying. Garden suites have been pretty hot lately. Again, uh, a great way to boost overall value and still kind of crank out a burr from it, um, but also add in some additional rental income from the suite, uh, helping to pay off that mortgage as you go. 
Yeah, I think as you see you know, inventory numbers still really low, you know, we're going to have an issue with you know, housing prices increasing. So there's only a handful of ways that the government can combat that. And one of them is allowing for higher density. And a lot of municipalities are allowing for multiple units now in a property without having to change the zoning. So Kitchener, Waterloo, um, you're now allowed to have three units um, as long as they're legal and with the city. Um, but you don't have to actually change the zoning. That could save a ton of money and increase a ton of cash flow. So house hacking is predominantly what we see for a lot of first time investors trying to maximize their purchase and get into that next purchase. Um, next, you know, age old, a lot of people know this one, but student houses, student rentals have been really difficult to finance in the last 12 to 16 months, specifically because of COVID and you know, a lot of banks are no longer or were not allowing for student financing just because the uncertainty around when are students going to go to school, can I guarantee the revenue, but that being said, they are now getting back into student rentals because students are going to be going back to school in September. Um, student rentals are a great way to have high cash flow on a property. Um, there are a handful of challenges when looking at student rentals. For example, you can't purchase them just conventionally as an owner-occupied property, or if you are going to, it's really difficult to purchase around the area of the university. Um, lenders know they're going to be used for student rentals. There's there's higher insurance. There's um, a lot of rental. A lot of lenders just don't like that students are renting the house. Um, so if you are gonna be looking for a student rental, there are specific programs that are based off of the actual revenue being generated on the property that can help you get into these uh, these investments. Yeah, and the nice thing about these specific pro um, specific products is that they're actually based off revenue by the bed. So you don't have to worry about trying to jam everybody into one or two leases. You know, They understand it's a student rental, it's specifically on the application, and it's per bed. So it's a nice way to be able to increase the cash flow. You're not trying to maximize one lease you know if you have seven or eight beds you know you can you can bang out 650 700 bucks per bed you know that's, that's a significant amount of cash flow coming in um, on the small commercial side they do have the debt service at a slightly higher ratio than what some of the other properties are but again with that per bed basis on the rental income it can be quite easy to attain those debt servicing ratios needed by the credit unions to acquire financing so the next one we want to talk about number five are short-term rentals or what uh, Airbnb is what the majority of them are, are being called. You know, as everyone knows, Airbnb can really be a really strong way to acquire cash flow. Um, the the short-term rental game has really taken off in the last couple of years and has become a really hot topic. In terms of getting financing done on, on buildings that are specifically Airbnbs, you know, the, the lenders are not accepting Airbnb rental income to help qualify. You know, this is gonna be a building that you're gonna have to purchase, uh, you know, with a cash down payment, not using any additional cash flow coming from that building, um, or if you have, non-subject properties again using that airbnb income is you know if it's a short-term rental they're just not going to allow it when moving forward so this is really going to rely on your own personal strength of your income um, and having that cash down payment but once you get into the property putting it up as an airbnb you know it's a, it's a strong way to be able to produce rental income especially if you can get some of these cottages that you know, are going for you know easily thousand dollars few thousand dollars over a weekend so it can be a great strategy for sure and i think as we move into banks understanding this space, you might see a little bit of uh, malleability and them understanding the revenue that can be generated from these. But currently right now, um, they are high, they do have a hard time and you, with using any sort of rental income at all, as Aaron said, on qualifying for the property. Um, there are a few banks that if you do claim the rental income on your T1 general over a two year period, they are starting to use that rental income and using it uh, for subject properties that you're looking at in the future. So. Something to keep in mind if you are going to be using Airbnb income on a certain rental property that you already own, if you start claiming it in a few years from now, you possibly might be able to use it with a conventional lender. Um, rent to own. So rent to own is a really interesting concept and this isn't for somebody who's looking to take the rent to own, this is for an investor. So. Essentially, the way it works is an investor will qualify for the loan. Um, they will uh, bring the down payment down and they will essentially allow somebody or help somebody to transition into a position where they can purchase the house from them. Um, this is a great way to earn a high ROI. We actually just went golfing with the guys from JAG. Um, they do a phenomenal job and uh, they offer crazy returns on investments. So if you guys are looking to, offer, to be an investor in a rent to own situation, highly recommend reaching out to those guys. Yeah, absolutely. Number seven is flipping. Um, obviously, flipping, house flipping has been around for a while now. You know, probably doesn't need as much of an introduction, but you know, flipping can be a great way. But it is very market specific. 
specific. So on this one, you know, you're really going to have to understand what kind of market are you in. If you're in a market where, you know, house prices are inflating quickly, um, at the beginning of that market, you know, it can be a great time to start flipping the houses. You're going to be able to take advantage of that rapidly increasing appreciation, uh, not necessarily just forced appreciation, but the actual market appreciation as well too. So you're going to get the value of your ad plus the value of that market that's rapidly expanding. Now, obviously moving forward with that and throughout those hot markets, you, you got to start taking a look at, you know, are you buying too close to the end or you know if there's a whole lot of talk of it being in a bubble you know really do your research and making sure you're not buying at the tipping point where you think you're going to have you know this 40 percent increase in your revenue but you know the market takes a dip and it pulls back maybe 20 percent and your profits aren't quite where you think they are and being able to get all your funds um, out of that product is going to be quite more difficult or maybe it starts to sit on the market a little bit longer than what you expected if you're in a private mortgage you know what does that do for your bottom line in terms of carrying costs so it can be a great way to make cash. You know, there's a lot of um, a lot of equity available in the flips, but it can also be a bit volatile as well too, depending on what type of market you are and what your timing is. For sure, I think dialing in your overall costs is really important. Understanding that have a that you need a product that gives you the flexibility to break. You know, there's a lot of people out there who come to us saying, you know, I got this closed product. You know, understanding what that cost is going to be when you want to break versus maybe taking an open product with a higher overall carrying costs might be a better option depending on how large your loan is and when you want to actually complete your project. So understanding the products that are available to you is also one of the key factors of being really successful in flipping. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, we do have a, a partner that we do lots of flip financing with. So if you have any questions, reach out to Aaron or myself. Now transitioning from a flip, we're going to go into a burr. So as many of you know, the burr strategy is a great way to be able to build wealth and scale your rental portfolio. So you're going to buy a property, you're going to renovate that property, you're going to rent that property out, you're going to refinance it, and then you're going to repeat that process. Um, it's a tried and true way to be able to scale your rental portfolio. Um, it does take a little bit of capital to do it, and um, it's, again, it's really important to be able to use a product that's going to work best for you because it's a very short-term acquisition to refinance products. So finding a product that's going to have a open or variable term to allow you to not have to take on a huge penalty to be able to restructure that debt down the road is going to make you super successful when completing this uh, strategy. Yeah, and, and the big key here is making sure that you can ref, uh, you know, afford that refinance ahead of time. Obviously, you don't want to get into the project, put all the cash in, and then realize down the road that you can actually afford that new increase in value. So, you know, talk to us beforehand. Make sure that we can, you know, we can run the application on the purchase. We can change the numbers around, run on the refinance. Make sure that affordability is there. Because again, like I said, the last thing you want to do is get stuck in that. Maybe have to go to a private mortgage just to be able to carry it and now now you're just eating away at that bottom line and you know that cash flow isn't going to be there so um, you know really making sure that that affordability is there down the road because you know the bird doesn't work without that refinance and if you can't refinance now all you've done is just trap that money in a project and you're starting from scratch with you know bare minimum capital so get that pre-qualification first talk to your mortgage broker first make sure that refinance is an option down the road last but not least number nine we want to talk about land development um, a lot of cool options options for land development doesn't necessarily have to be you know giant condo towers this could be anything from small little conversion products to um, infill type stuff where you're buying a single family lot maybe it has you know, quite a quite a bit of extra space, and you're going to sever that lot, build another uh, single family home, or maybe a small density, medium density type building, or maybe you're just going to uh, demolish the building that's on there, split the lot up. You know, there's there's lots of options on this. Um, you know, it, it's a it's a very vast topic. Um, land development has a lot of capital expenditure required, so you you know maybe for the beginning investor, this isn't quite the greatest option, but for those who have built up some capital or have liquidity in their other properties that they can tap into and pull out, you know, this can be a really great option. The boost in value from taking your land from just, you know, a raw piece of land to a service piece of land or, you know, a single family residential zoning, getting that rezoned into a, uh, you know, a multi-use and a higher density, you know, that, that brings an immediate lift in that land. And that alone can be quite um, rewarding from the uh, revenue side just by going through that rezoning process. For sure. Yeah. A lot of people are starting to look at land development a little bit more seriously, specifically because if you start to look at what's happening with the multifamily market, and we spoke about this at our last live stream, um, 
the values of these properties are increasing at such a rapid pace that the revenue generated on these properties isn't keeping up. So the amount of cash required to get into these properties conventionally is starting to become significant, more significant than it was even previous before um, before COVID. But if you start to crunch the numbers and figure out what does it cost to actually build one of these, um, you know, you don't need all of the money to construct the building. Usually you're looking at between 10 and 15% of the actual cost to build and then you have to put a little bit of a larger down payment down on the land, but that cost may be more, or may, sorry, maybe less than what it would cost for you to have to cash for keys, a 10 plex. You know, so factoring in that overall cost and being able to build something and set your own rent and have the revenue where you need it to be for conventional financing right away is starting to become a really hot topic for a lot of uh, a lot of real estate investors. So if this is something that you've been pondering with or you want to crunch the numbers to figure out if this works for you, reach out to Aaron and myself. We work with a handful of really great lenders um, that would be able to offer you some phenomenal financing. Thanks so much for watching, guys. If you guys like this video, check out our Instagram, The Finlay Team. Hit the like button, smash the subscribe button. We are trying to make a ton of content for you, and if we can add value, you know, we would very much appreciate it if you just hit that subscribe button button. Thanks so much for watching. Take care. We'll see you next time. See you guys. I hope that video introduced you to some new concepts that you might not have known before. Please take the time now to go and visit the Finley Mortgage Team. You can find all their details right below me. And while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe.